Uh, well, today we uh, continue a series uh, that we've been in for the past couple weeks called God, I Doubt It. And where this series comes from is, is really this uh, idea that you, you read your Bible and you go, man, that's a pretty far-fetched story. God, God, I doubt that actually happened. And you read these miracles, you read these things that happen in Scripture, you're just like, man, I just doubt it, you know? Or, or a guy like me comes up here, a pastor preaches a sermon, and you're just like, I just doubt that's for me. I, I doubt God has that for me, and I doubt kind of what you're saying. You may have been in a place like that before where you just kind of, you sit in a church service, you read your Bible, you're just left with uh, some doubts. And maybe there's just some questions that you have, and maybe you're embarrassed or even ashamed to ask those questions because you, you, you just, you might think, am I the only one that has these doubts? Like, and if I'm, if I'm going to say something, am I going to be ridiculed and be the, the church doubter and we're all going to point and laugh at you, you know? And so you, you might feel ashamed or embarrassed, so you just stay silent. You stay silent and you stay confused. Well, I just want you to know that you're not alone, and so this series is meant to hopefully encourage you in your doubt. And the theme verse for the series is Matthew 28, 16 through 17. This verse comes to us after Jesus had lived his life out, performed all these many miracles, did these amazing things that we see throughout Scripture. Uh, and then he, he goes to the cross. He dies on the cross. He's buried in the tomb. He's risen from the dead. People see him alive. And then we read this verse. So it's after the life and ministry of Jesus. Check this out. The 11 disciples, these guys who went with Jesus everywhere. They traveled with Jesus. They knew Jesus. They, they were with him for these three years. They went to where Jesus told them to go on the mountain. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. But some doubted. I think it's amazing that those who saw the risen Christ, I mean, this guy they saw die on a cross, and now they see him in the flesh, living, they saw the miracles he performed, they knew him personally, now he's standing before them, and they still had some doubts. Okay, that should relieve you of any doubts that you might be having about your faith right now. If these dudes walked with Jesus and still had some doubts, you're okay to have some doubts of your own. You see, it's okay to doubt, but we cannot allow our doubts to, dis- to detour us in our faith. So in week one, we kicked this series off asking this question, where does my doubt come from? It's a great place to start. Where is this doubt even coming from? And here's what we learned, that we doubt because we have some questions that need some answers. You've just been thinking about some things. You don't have the answer for those things, and so you doubt. But in pursuing God and asking him those questions, our belief begins to be strengthened. We also talked about how to overcome our doubt, and we do so by having faith. And as we move and operate in faith, the doubts that we once had slowly begin to dissipate, and faith becomes bolden within us. All right, that was week one. Last week, I talked about how our doubts can lead us away from our faith. Like, if you're not careful, the doubts that you were holding in can actually lead you to this place of not even being a believer or a Christian any further. We talked about this idea of deconstruction. It's this highly controversial and highly discussed topic within the body of Christ right now, this, this concept of deconstructing, de- deconstruction. And, and what I was arguing is that it can be beneficial to you if it's done correctly, but it also can be detrimental to you if it's done poorly. If you, if you deconstruct your faith to the place where you do not reconstruct it, you will walk away from the faith. That's why it's dangerous. But I think it's important to, to take apart our faith, to deconstruct our faith to the point to where we go, why did I believe this? When this happened to me, why do I allow this to affect me? I need, I need to get these things out of here that are not right, that are not correct theology, that are things, experiences that happened to me. I need to get that out of there and not allow that to mess with my faith system. You deconstruct, you take away the, the fluff, the crap, the stuff that shouldn't be there, and you reconstruct it around Jesus. And that's what we talked about last week. And today, I want to talk about doubting your faith because of others. Doubting your faith because of others. I'm not talking about Billy Graham and Mother Teresa. I'm talking about the hypocrites in the church, y'all. That's where we're going today. Today, I want to talk about how confusing it might be for a doubter to aspire to have great faith in God. And then they come to God and they come to church and then they see some hypocrites in the faith, and then they begin to doubt their own faith and wonder if this is even for them. So I want to talk about how Christians can let you down, and because of that, they can cause you to doubt your faith. All right, so here's the message title for today, Doubting Due to Hypocrites. If you're taking message notes, the title of this morning's message is Doubting Due to Hypocrites. Let's pray. 
Jesus help us. Amen. All right. I'm going to talk about hypocrites. I'm going to talk about some hypocrites today. I, need, I think I need some help. You know, when I was, I was like, how do I, okay, we're, there's no hypocrites in here, right? We're not talking about us. Talking about them out there, right? With that in mind. Don't you just love someone who says one thing but does another? Like, how many of y'all love that? That's like an attribute you look in people, in friendships, maybe in a significant other. I just want someone who's going to be a hypocrite, right? We all love that, right? No, obviously we don't. I mean, we all have that friend that says they'll come to the party and then they don't show up, right? How many of y'all have that friend, right? Yeah, not invited anymore. Or you have the boss that uh, promises you the promotion or promises you that raise, and then it just never comes. They don't give it to you, right? We don't like that either. Or maybe you have a family member that says they're going to be there to help you out, and then when it comes time to needing help, they just don't show up. Or, or maybe this one might resonate. We see this all the time. We're about to see a lot of it right now. But you see a politician that runs on an issue, and once they get into office, they do not deliver on that which they promise, right? We all love a good hypocrite, don't we? No, okay, I got it. We see hypocrites all throughout society, but one place hypocrisy does not belong, yet it does, is in the church. The biggest complaint against the church at large is that the church is full of judgmental, narrow-minded, hypocritical Christians. And sadly, there are many people all over the world who doubt God and doubt their faith because of the Christians that they see in the church that claim to live one way, yet they live another. You see, hypocrisy within the church can be very, very confusing to the doubter. Uh, for example, you have a friend who loves to just post Instagram posts or uh, what else is there? T TikTok? I, I don't know. I feel so... But anyways, th like this is what I love about people. They, they like, they'll like, okay, they wake up in the morning, they put their Bible there, you know, and they're like, put their coffee, you know, and like, like the journal and some pens and they take a, sh a snapshot and then they, they just go eat breakfast, right? It's like, <laughs> like, you know, I, like I love the people who just like, they love to put that front on. You know, you have a friend who loves to post Bible verses or Instagram posts or whatever. And then on the weekend, they go freaking crazy, right? They're drinking and cussing like a sailor. And uh, yeah, that can be very confusing for the doubter. Or maybe you had a boss who claimed to be a Christian and wanted to run his company on biblical values and, and Christian values, yet he treated people poorly and he was extremely greedy. That might be confusing to the doubter. Or, or you had a parent who raised you on Christian values, took you to church. Some of y'all drug you to church. I know how it goes. And then they had an affair, and they broke their marriage vows, and they're not together anymore. Man, that might be very confusing for the doubter. Or maybe you had a pastor who taught you the Bible, who proclaimed to live a godly life, yet that pastor was caught living a very immoral life. And that could be very confusing to the doubter. It's confusing to people who have an interest in God, Yet they look at the people of God, and they see that the people of God are not living the way of God. It's confusing to the doubter. And sadly, when we think about church today as a society, unfortunately, this is what other people think about. They think about scandals, which we're seeing some of the news right now. They see abuse. They think about corruption, judgment, hate, and hypocrisy. When that is not at all the church that Jesus gave his life for. Author Brennan Manning has a gut-wrenching quote, sobering, watch this, the single greatest cause of atheism, those who refuse to believe in God, is in the world today, is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, then walk out the door and deny him with their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. If you're confused today about God or the things of God, or even you're doubting your faith today due to the hypocrisy of Christians, I'm here to tell you you're not alone. And, and if you look at Scripture, Jesus absolutely despised hypocrites. He could not stand it when someone would say one thing, yet do another. And there was nothing that Jesus spoke more strongly against than those that he called hypocrites. In fact, in Matthew 23, we see a whole chapter devoted to hypocrites. And in chapter 23, he has a little section there. It's called the seven woes. It's seven strict warnings that Jesus spoke to those who claimed to be one thing but yet lived another thing. 
Let me show you one of those woes that's in Matthew 23, verse 27. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. 17 different times in the Bible, you will find this word hypocrite. 17 different times. And each time it's used by Jesus correcting those who would say one thing but yet do another. In fact, Jesus was actually the one who introduced this idea of hypocrites within our context of Scripture and within faith. You see, a hypocrite was actually used in theater at the time, and it was a character used, and that character was called Hippocrates, Hippocrates. And so this character, now forgive me because I have kids and it's the only mask I can find. <laughs> Just let it sink in, okay? Um, so Hippocrates would put on a mask and be Hulk for the moment, right? And he would, he, would, he would perform in a mask and then they would change and he'd become somebody else. That's Hippocrates. When you put on a mask and you are different characters, some of y'all aren't going to get that image out of your head. And Jesus takes this term and this idea and he uses it for Christians. He says, hey, when you give so people can see you give, you make a big deal when you give, you're a hypocrite. You're not giving unto the Lord. You're giving for selfish gain. He says when you fast so people can see you fast and you act like you're suffering and you're telling everybody you're not eating for the Lord, man, you're a hypocrite. You're not fasting to connect with God. You're fasting because you want people to think you're more holy than you really are. He says that when you pray and you pray so people can see you pray, you pray loud prayers on the street corners, man, you're a hypocrite. You're not praying to talk to God. You're praying so that you can get attention from others. He was essentially saying this. You are a play actor. You're fake. And you, you are not to be taken seriously. You, you do one thing, yet you live another. But one thing that's important to point out in this is that Jesus was, was not calling out their specific sin. I love this about Jesus. Jesus was not calling out their sin. He was calling out the show. Like, like he, he didn't say, woe to you who slice a golf ball on the golf course and cuss. Like, he didn't get that specific and that granular. He said, woe to you who say one thing and live another. I mean, Jesus absolutely despised hypocrites. Watch how strong his language is in verse 33 of Matthew 23. Watch this. You snakes. How many of y'all have ever been called a snake before? You snake. You brood of vipers. Watch this one. How will you escape being condemned to hell? I think it's safe to say Jesus did not prefer the hypocrite, right? And, and if you were ever frustrated with hypocrites within the church, Jesus was too. Which leads me to this question, why do so many Christians get it wrong? I mean, sometimes we get it right, but other times we get it wrong. I want to help you today by giving you three points on how to not doubt your faith due to the hypocrisy of Christians. Okay, that's what we're going to go today. Three points. How, how to not doubt my faith due to them, <laughs> due to the hypocrisy of a Christian. Okay, here's the first point. You got to understand there are different types of Christians, all right? Different types of Christians. I want to break this down for you. There's three different types of Christians that you have to understand, okay? The first type of Christians is this, and, and we don't really like these people. This is the fake Christians, the fake Christians. You might have met them before. Some Christians, get this church, might not be Christians at all. There are some people who claim to be followers of Christ, yet they have never surrendered their lives fully to Christ. They may attend church, carry a Bible, post the Instagram post of their Bible, raise their hands in worship, yet they have never been transformed by the power of Jesus. Titus says it this way in Titus 1.16, they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny God. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. We need to understand that going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Following Jesus makes you a Christian. Like, like claiming to love God doesn't make you a Christian. Following Jesus makes you a, a Christian. Voting Christian, Republican, doesn't make you a Christian. <laughs> following Jesus and voting Republican, no, I'm kidding, makes you a Christian. <laughs> Y'all got me all fired up today. All right. Oh, secret's out. All right. Um, 
actually stand for biblical values. Shocker. All right. Um, so why is it that Christians let you down and cause you to doubt your faith? Well, it's because those Christians are not really Christians in the first place. I got to be honest with you. I worked at a mega church for seven years before I planted Zao Church. And I can confidently tell you there were pastors on staff of that church that were not Christian. And, and I reported to one of them. And somehow this church hired a demon. I, I, I said it jokingly, but also seriously. I worked for a demon. And, and you, you could not convince me that this person was a Christian. Now, okay, I, I get it. Who can judge the heart of a man? Nobody but God. I'm, I'm with you on that. But here's what I want you to hear. Their actions did not line up with the faith they proclaimed. I'm telling you, I have met people who claim to be Christian, yet how they lived their life did not line up with their belief that they proclaimed. I know you might doubt because of Christians, but I'm telling you, some Christians are not really Christians at all. They're fake Christians, all right? Hopefully that helps you a little bit. Here's the second type of Christians right here. This is the immature Christians, the immature Christians. And some Christians just haven't learned the way of Jesus yet. They're growing in their faith. They're young in their faith. They're early on in their spiritual walk with God. Here's how the writer of Hebrews describes these people in Hebrews 5, 13, and 14. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. I mean, have your child negotiate your next business deal. It, it's just, it just won't work out well because they, they are young. They don't know the ways yet. When a person becomes a Christian, they have a lot to learn, a lot to grow in, a lot to walk in, especially if they didn't grow up in the faith at all or around the church at all. I mean, think about it. The teachings of Scripture and the principles of Scripture, we're all trying to figure it out. Like, there's a lot to learn and a lot to digest here. But for a new convert to learn all of this, it's going to take some time. Like, for me, for example, I remember I accepted Christ when I was in high school. I, I remember... Uh, when I did that, I became on fire for Jesus. Like, Jesus freak to the max, had the shirts, the lanyards, the seat. I was like Jesus freak, talking to everybody about Jesus. What was probably confusing to people is while I was witnessing to people, talking to them about Jesus, I was also cussing, like, with passion, you know? Like, Jesus is awesome, you know? Like, that was my, like, that was... <laughs> That's literally where I was. And I mean, so I was immature in my faith. The, the, I, was, I was there, and my heart was right, but, but I was just immature in my faith. I didn't know yet. I didn't know yet. That was probably confusing for people. You may doubt your faith due to the Christians that just might be a little bit immature in their faith. Okay, that's the second group. But here's the third one where a lot of us might fall into, and it's just right here. Then you have the sinful Christians. I mean, Christians are humans who mess up. Everybody say amen, right? All right. There are some really, really good, well-intended believers in Jesus who make mistakes and sin from time to time. Now, Christians are real people who are tempted and targeted by a real devil. And I got to tell you, when Christians like this mess up, it doesn't mean that they're hell-bound hypocrites. It just means they made a mistake. They still love Jesus, yet they made a poor decision. They still love Jesus, yet they were unwise and unkind in their words. They still love Jesus, yet they gave in to temptation. They made a grave mistake. And here's what I know. The enemy is real, and his job description is to seek and kill and destroy. Okay, so we have a real enemy out there, which means you're vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. And the moment that you think that you're not vulnerable, you're in trouble. We are all susceptible to the attacks of the devil. Paul... This hero in the faith, like next to Jesus, like I don't know if you can find a greater man, right? Paul, the apostle. Watch this. This is how Paul feels. Romans 5, or, or 7, 15 through 20. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. Does that resonate with anybody in this room? <laughs> he goes on and it gets really confusing. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good as it is. It is no longer I myself who do it, but it's a sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, it's my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I just can't do it. For I do not do, okay, for I do not do the good I want to do, 
but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I, okay, if I do, I told you it's confusing. If I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. That's just like, okay, so basically he really has good intentions. Like he wants to do this thing right. He just can't live it out. And I think it's safe to say that if the sinful nature is real and present in the Apostle Paul, those of us who are maturing in the faith, we are capable of making some mistakes. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. You may doubt your faith due to Christians, but just know that some Christians, they're, they're fake, some are immature, and some just are sinful Christians who make mistakes just like you and me. Okay. So how to not, not doubt your faith due to the hypocrisy of Christians first? You just got to understand that they're different types of Christians. I'm excited about the second point right here. Here's a second way to not allow that to affect your faith. Understand who the hypocrite really is. Some of y'all just like got uncomfortable. I felt it in the room. Here we go. Now, I find it funny that when we make mistakes, see if you resonate with this. When we make mistakes in our own lives, when we sin, we fall short, we make some mistakes, we blame our circumstances. Jack, you know me, you know my heart, you know I didn't mean that, I'm, I'm real sorry, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know my heart, you know, you know me. Monica, it wasn't a big deal, I was just tired, I was frustrated, did you hear what they said to me? Maybe I was under a lot of pressure, I, I didn't have any other option, I didn't want to do it, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know what to do in the moment, I just had to do it. Come on, I was having a bad day, I had a lot going on, I was stressed out, and it's not a big deal. And, and, and let me, let's be honest, you've made the same mistakes, right? We blame our circumstances. If I fall short, I blame my circumstances. I give myself all the grace in the world, but the challenge is when someone else falls short, we tend to blame their character, not their circumstances. Jack, you're the bad one. You never get it right. You're always wrong. You're the mistake. Monica, you always do that. You never get it right. So now instead of blaming their circumstances, I'm blaming their character. So what we do as human beings is we blame our mistakes on our circumstances, and we blame the mistakes of others on their character. Isn't that hypocrisy? So let's talk about theology for a moment on this. Why is it that when we sin, God doesn't fall off his throne? <laughs> like when God, God watches us sin, he's not shocked. He's not surprised. He doesn't leave. He doesn't leave us. Why? Because he knows that we're sinners in need of a saving grace. Here's what the book of Psalms says, Psalms 103, 14. For he knows, I love this, how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. <clears throat> he knows how weak we are, and he remembers we're only dust. This passage just humanizes us all. It puts us all in the same playing field. Why? Because we all came from dust, and we all make mistakes, which makes us all weak. We sin, we lie, we fall into temptation, we get angry, we lust, we're weak. So when someone lets you down, or a pastor, let's go there, <clears throat> if a pastor like me offends you, just remember I am weak and I am dusty. <laughs> this is going to help you, I promise you. I am weak. And I am dusty. And by the way, so are you. When you want to judge people, remember, you too are weak and dusty. We are all capable of making mistakes, and we are all susceptible to sin. At the same time, we are desperately in need of Jesus. So who's the hypocrite? The weak and dusty one. This will make even more sense as I jump into point number three here. Here's the third way. To not doubt your faith due to the hypocrisy of Christians. Check this one out. Understand how to overlook the hypocrite, okay? I'm not going to allow them to determine my faith, and I'm going to overcome the doubt. I'm going to overcome the doubt. So we see a real example of this in Acts 13. Paul and Barnabas, these disciples of Jesus, they face some hypocrites in the church. Watch what happens. Acts 13, 49 through 50. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. In verse 50, or verse 50 here, but the Jewish leaders, leaders in the church, incited the God-fearing women of high standing in the leading 
men of the city. So this is the pastors, the elders. This is the prayer team. <laughs> this, is, this was the, the, the church leadership team right here. And what did they do? They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, these men of God, and they expelled them out of the region. They kicked them out of the church. What does that mean? This means that well-intended church people get it wrong from time to time. I'm sure they weren't bad people. They just got it wrong. And in so doing, they drove these two disciples of Jesus away from the church. I'm telling you right now, well-intended church people are wrong from time to time. We can be wrong from time to time. I can be wrong from time to time. And what Paul and Barnabas did might shock you. What, what do you think Paul and Barnabas did when they were kicked out of a church? They were offended by others. Did they leave the faith? Did they walk away from Jesus altogether? No, they didn't do that. But here's what I know. They could have done that. They could have walked away from the faith altogether had they focused on the offense. This is huge, y'all. When you focus on the offense, it will drive you away from the church. Paul and Barnabas had maturity to realize that it was not God that pushed them away. It was sinful people. I had a pastor say this uh, a long time ago, and, and I don't know how I feel about it, but it's true. I don't even like it, but I'm going to say it anyways. He, he would always say this. If you haven't been hurt in church before, you haven't been going to church long enough. I don't like that, but it is true. I, I've been hurt in church before. But, but I knew that it wasn't the church that hurt me. It was people within the church that hurt me. When I've been wronged and betrayed in the church, which I have, I had the maturity to understand it was not God. It was weak and dusty people. But, but we do this in faith. Like, like, go with me on this one. We're, pastor says something. We're hurt in church. And because of what the pastor said, we refuse to go to church any longer. I don't understand this logic because we do it with church, but yet we don't do it with restaurants. <laughs> You have bad service at a restaurant, I am never eating food again. The server was rude, the food was cold, I'm never eating food ever again. You see, when restaurants let us down, we go back to the restaurant. Why? Because there's food in the house. So when the church lets you down, you go back to church because there's spiritual food in the house. Paul and Barnabas decided that they were not going to allow the sins of people to keep them away from the goodness of God. And how many people do we see do that today? They allow things that somebody said to them or, or a thing that the pastor said they just didn't agree with. Like, like <laughs> you're not Republican, you're leaving the church after that one comment. You're going to hold on to that one offense, that one offense. You're going to walk away from the faith altogether because of that one comment. They refused to allow hypocritical people to keep them from growing closer to the God who loved them. You see, they refused to allow weak and dusty people to detour them. So what did they do? Here's their response. Think about this. Verse 51. So they shook the dust off their feet. I love that passage. These weak and dusty people, they shook their dust off their feet. As a warning, I think also as symbolic Warning to them, and went to Iconium, a different place. They, they left the place, went to a different place. And the disciples were filled there with joy and with the Holy Spirit, not offense. You see, when there is an offense, you can either dwell on the offense, you can dwell on the dust, or you can focus on the Holy Spirit. Here's the takeaway for today. Don't dwell on the dust, church. Don't dwell on the dust. I don't know who this is for, but some of you have been hurt by church leaders, been hurt by a church, people within the church, and you have walked with offense for many years. Maybe it was 20 years. Happened when you were younger. Or maybe it was two weeks ago or two minutes ago in my last comment, right? <laughs> you have two choices. You can focus on the dust or you can focus on the Holy Spirit, but you can't do both. Right. Now, I don't want to minimize your offense. Maybe something absolutely horrible happened to you. So I don't want to minimize that. But I do believe you have to shake the dust. And in the words of the great theologian Taylor Swift, some of y'all need to shake it off, all right? <laughs> Just shake it off. <laughs> now, <laughs> say, I know, it might be hard. And it might take a lot of shaking for some of you, okay? 
But be like the disciples. Learn to shake off the offense. And when you shake off the offense, you shake off the dust, you will find yourself being full of joy in the Lord and being full of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's necessary. And I'm begging you to go through the process and and not let another day go where you are holding on to the offense of somebody committed against you 20 years ago. You think that's keeping them up at night? They don't even know about it. You think that pastor knows that he offended you? Has no clue. No clue. So why not shake the dust off, walk in the joy of the Lord, and embrace the Holy Spirit? I'm telling you, for me... you may have an opportunity to do it, but I feel like every week the Lord gives me an opportunity to shake the dust off. <laughs> every week I have the opportunity to be offense. I'm so lucky, right? Oh, let's look around real quick. I know it's recorded. They don't watch anyways, but okay, I don't see this person. <clears throat> watch what you say to me. I might use it as a sermon illustration. <clears throat> um, a couple weeks ago, a lady pulled me aside between services and wanted to tell me how theologically incorrect my sermon was, how wrong I was, how right she was. I love those encounters, especially between services. <clears throat> I'm going to go change my whole message. Um, I had a decision. I could walk in a fence or I could walk in the Holy Spirit. So I cussed her out and walked offended. I just... <laughs> Poor joke, I know, poor timing, I know. (laughs) It's a choice, it's a choice. (laughs) And I choose joy over offense. If I was offended coming in preaching that second sermon, it wouldn't have been good. I gotta walk in joy. As I close here, I I, I wanna take a moment to address those of you who have ever been offended within the church. Take my opportunity as a pastor. I just want to say that I'm sorry. And whether it's this church, whether it's another church, the church has not always gotten it right. We sometimes say one thing, but we do another. And the church at large, the Big C Church, has abused its power, neglected people, mistreated people, hurt people. And it's not right, but I'm here to tell you it's also not the heart of God. And as a pastor within the church, I just want to say that I'm sorry if you've been hurt or offended. And I'm even, I'm even more sorry if you've left with some doubts in the faith because of what somebody has said to you. And I want to say this too, as your pastor, I have the absolute best intentions. I don't come up here every week thinking, how can I offend some people, you know? I really want to piss some people off today. That'd be wonderful, you know? Hopefully I'll have five people leave the church. That'd be, that's my goal today. <clears throat> I have well intentions coming up here every single week, but I still have the ability to offend you and leave you with some doubts. I I know that. I know that. It's not my intention, but I know there's a possibility that you may walk away offended. So I'm asking you a favor. I'm encouraging you. Choose joy over offense. It's a choice. You can stop me between services and let me have it. That's But that's your choice. That's your choice. When the desire is to be offended and that desire arises, I'm encouraging you to shake it off. Shake it off. And I want to say this in the most loving way possible, but it's going to come across strong. If you have lost faith in Jesus because of people, maybe your faith was in people instead of being in Jesus. If you're doubting today, I would encourage you to not put your faith in people. Put your faith in Jesus. Man, look how Jesus lived his life and how Jesus treated people. Look at how he confronted hypocrisy and corrected it with grace and love. Look at how Jesus treated those who were in power and those who were, who were hypocrites and misused their power. Jesus, every time, would defend the oppressed. Every time, he would correct the one who was in authority Look at how Jesus defended those who were in the church 
and who were mistreated and overlooked, the poor, the widow, the sick, the prostitute, the one in prison, the down and out, the loner, the outcast. You see, Jesus had zero tolerance for hypocrisy, but he had unlimited grace for a sinner who's in need of forgiveness. So forgive us when we're wrong. We're weak and dusty. And we're imperfect, but yet we're being perfected day by day by the grace of God. But I'm with you. I think the reputation for Christians needs to change. I hate that we're labeled as hypocrites and judgmental people. I hate that people are leaving the faith or even walking away with some doubt about God because of Christians. And I'm here to tell you it's not what God intended. This is not what God established. Instead of being judgmental and hypocritical, here was Jesus' vision for the church. Let me show it to you in John 13, 35. But this, everyone will know that you are my disciple, that you're a Christian, that you're a Christ follower. How? If you love one another. Not if you judge one another. Not if you hate one another. If you love one another. And one of the most powerful ways to love is to forgive. So if you're carrying a hurt today, I understand but it's time to shake it off. And when you do, I know what's waiting for you on the other side. You will find joy in the Lord and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So don't doubt due to the hypocrisy of Christians. Shake off the dust and embrace the love of Jesus. Can I pray for you where you're at? I just feel like I want to do some ministry. I want to pray for those who have been hurt in the church before. Maybe it was a church leader. Maybe it was a, it was a small group leader. Maybe it was somebody in passing. Maybe it was a, a somebody on TV or a video you watched. And maybe it was somebody, a mentor, somebody you really looked up to, and they, they hurt you. And, and for all these years, maybe it's two weeks or 20 years, you've been walking with offense. Well, right now, in the name of Jesus, we release that offense. We put that offense down at the feet of Jesus. We can't carry it anymore. We're not supposed to carry it anymore. And I just have a picture right now. God wants to give you something. He wants to put something in your hands, but you can't receive it because you're already carrying offense. How can you receive blessing? How can you receive forgiveness? How can you receive mercy? How can you receive the favor of God if you're carrying on to offense? So right now, we just lay that offense down at your feet, Jesus. And right now, we forgive that person. It's not saying what they did was right or okay or even that we'll restore that relationship. But we're just releasing that so that we can walk in love. We can walk in, in joy. That's what we want. We don't want to be bound up any longer by this offense. We want to walk in the joy of the Lord. This is believe that's taking place right now. In Jesus' name. I want to pray also for those who have never made a decision to trust Jesus. It's got to be a moment in your life where you surrender control of your life and you give it over to Jesus. Until then, you're just a fake Christian. You haven't, done, you haven't done it. You're a play actor. You say one thing and you do another. And being a Christian is, is real transformation. The old goes away, the new comes. You become a new creation in Christ. If that's never happened for you, I want to pray for you right now. I want you to pray this to God. Say, God, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me on a cross in my place for my sins. And right now in this moment, I receive the faith of Jesus. Save me. Make me new. I want to be like you. And I'll spend the rest of my life walking and following after you. Today I give you my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Can we clap and celebrate those who prayed that prayer?